pay nice that you came over from Los Angeles indeed because I think this is a real great DLD match because Steffi knows that you love porcelain and um, to start with that I think it's a wonderful opportunity to have you here talking about your work and asking you some questions. Maybe you want to come up and share this experience. Thank you, Johannes and Steffi. I, I love being here, so this is great to be able to present more formally, but it's going to be that. It's going to be, there's not going to be algorithms or statistics. It's going to be images of projects that I've worked on, and many of which I've worked on with artists and artisans and people I've never met who don't speak English that maybe I met through social media, but just kind of taking advantage of my uh, inabilities as an artist to kind of capitalize on others' uh, expertise. So I'm just gonna go through uh, the images. This was sort of a title of the talk I was playing with because I realized in putting this together that, oh, <laughs> that there's a sort of themes that were coming up in my work and in this kind of, uh, Breakdown, and by the way, this is the first time I've spoken about my work in this way, so it's a little bit new. Um, so I went back to my studio in 1989, and I was in a garden, and I um, decided to collect the uncollectible, which were spider webs, and use the paper as a sort of storage device for these elusive collectible things. But then I also realized that these spiders were sort of fabricators, and that they were working in the night and I would harvest their um, product in the morning, and I got to know certain ones that had different skill sets and certain ones that were better and stronger, and I made a series of these. They're almost like architectural drawings where the web itself, you can see here in detail. It was just this kind of layering of webs. And this is, this is kind of a coincidence, but it's an interesting link. I went, my first trip to, to um, outside of the United States was to Europe specifically, Germany specifically, Munich. And I was walking down the streets in high school with my grandmother and I looked in this window and I saw the most amazing thing which was this Nymphenburg chandelier which was, didn't look quite like this but it was really festooned and over the top and sort of relentless but it was totally white and completely restrained and I thought that was just so weird. And as I, um, start to make a little money, I thought, well, now I feel like an adult, I can, I can just buy a Nymphenburg chandelier like I love, and I contacted them and they faxed me the prices of like $120,000. So I thought, well, I'm just gonna make my own Nymphenburg chandelier. And I was invited to participate in a project in Lithuania, and they were encouraging the artists to work with the Eastern European workforce. And these people I was, I was sort of paired up with they didn't speak English, I don't speak Lithuanian, and I just did a sketch and I carved some pieces of soap to look like kind of crystals and just hope for the best. And I just wanted them to interpret and see how far they could get. And instead of having these kind of cupids and other types of ornaments, it was their gesture that sort of stood in for the ornament, the sort of roughness, the kind of just almost like squeezing the clay became this kind of um, relentless ornament for me. But I also realized that this was a, this was a, these were people I was going to continue working with, and I have for over 10 years. We, they still don't speak English. I don't speak Lithuanian. But it allows me to do something that I'm very sort of protective of, which is to be alone, and to be alone in my space and not feel this kind of pressure of, a, of, a, of people who come and need to be instructed. I just kind of work on project-to-project -project basis with them. This is another amazing um, Nymphenburg chandelier that is beautiful and I have sort of made a variation on that with the Lithuanian craftsman, which was to take this kind of poetic and, and distort it through something very monstrous and to take this kind of Notre Dame gargoyle uh, component and, and sort of merge it with this kind of elegant um, phys uh, I don't know, representation of the figure. And here's another detail. And being from Los Angeles, car paint factored in, so we had an automotive sort of version of this also. And this is another variation. I'm gonna go through some images kind of quickly, just in the interest of time. And we make these popcorn pieces together, and popcorn for me was very, uh, was sort of perfect because I can say the scale model for this piece is at the market. 
and they can go to the market and it's sort of a universal form, it's very organic and it can accommodate sort of, to the tolerances are um, very low because the form is organic and it can accommodate this kind of looseness. So we continue making these popcorn pieces with platinum or gold interior, other versions. But this, I want to talk about this, it's sort of important. I was invited by a tapestry workshop in Mexico to develop something using their loom, which is a very traditional, they dye the wool, they hang it out in the morning, and then they weave this kind of, you know, image, and it takes forever. And I thought, you know, I just don't want to do a woven version of an image or a painting. I want to challenge the loom. I want the loom to struggle with what it is and to try to be something, to have the material, the wool, be something it isn't, which is reflective and, and deep. Uh, so I just wanted to, I wanted to almost break the loom in a way. So we embarked on this kind of series of tests. This probably took like three months. So it was, I was starting to realize what this uh, involvement with, these, with this labor was. We did more and more. And you can kind of see the, um, the roughness. It's beautiful, it's warm, and it's textured, but it was, um, a problem when I was developing the stage curtain for the new opera house in Oslo, and I realized this would take 20 years with these people to get this stage curtain that I wanted to do. And so I, in my research, or actually at a dinner party, I learned of a digital loom that was able to take this image, and um, this is it after it was woven, and weave it in like a week, and fill the opera house like this with cotton and polyester. So um, that's a scale, scale shot. And so you, it was just interesting to kind of gauge the kind of, um, you know, working with, within the kind of um, abilities of these people in different parts of the world. And it has allowed me to be left alone in a way, to not have people bothering me in my studio, to have this stuff being uh, sent out. This is something I thought I'd show. I'm working, we're in development right now, which is entirely gold um, and silver tapestry. These are some details. And also working with Mexico um, using it's just forms that were familiar to them. These are some trinkets that I want, and I wanted to make barbecues. And knowing that it would be rough and knowing that it would be uh, sort of broken and having and using that as as texture and a richness is to have this kind of brokenness and and but then I have to adjust my expectation and I'm okay with surprises. Only thing with Mexico is you, you, these are these glass bricks I made with them, which were supposed to be modules of water. If you want to sort of order, I guess. 50 blue glass bricks, sometimes you get this kind of variation. So you have to adapt and improvise sort of on the spot, because you typically the crate arrives the day of the opening. So I ordered 50 orange bricks, and what showed up was something very, very different. And so I just decided to have a melted piece and to make it feel like the color was melting and just to adapt to that um, expectation shift. I'm going to go quickly through this. Um, project, I worked with a pastry shop in Munster for a sort of takeaway artwork that was consumable as part of Sculpture Project Munster in 2007. And I wanted this kind of cultural cross-pollination of something that I felt felt very German to me, which was this kind of thing, which I love, um, and I don't see in Los Angeles, but what I see is this and this. So to have this uh, old school, multi-generational pastry shop, then do an interpretation of, to use a marzipan as sort of a, a raw material and make my uh, neighborhood um, in their neighborhood, and then we sold it uh, during the sculpture project for just, you know, pastry rates. <laughs> so you could buy this piece and um, eat it. And I'm gonna just jump, how am I with time? I'm okay. This is good. Like, like you wanna, like we can have a conversation that show your work. Okay. I think it's. This is just yeah. an example of working with people who I don't speak the same language with, but their ability to enhance a project. And this was at the Venice Biennale a few years ago, where I was dealing with this very large space that, to me, just told a lot of stories about um, mystery and intrigue. And I really fell in love with the space, and I wanted the viewers to get inside the space in the architecture through some means. And I wasn't sure how to do that. I wanted it to be intimate, but still visible. So I created a um, sort of a drop tapestry. 
sort of a plan, here's a plan, and then drop down this sort of ghost, and then have these penetrations of chandeliers that either were encrusted with birdseed or contained birdseed. But then I enlisted some um, people in the area, it's a 700-year-old hunting tradition of, of bird mimicry, and they, let's see. <laughs> So they occupied the space as viewers, and because they were so, re they sounded, the mimicry was so accurate, the viewers didn't notice these guys, but they looked into all the architecture, looking for the birds, looking in the crack, doing everything I really wanted them to do, and these people became that kind of device for me. Um, and I'm gonna jump through this and just finish up with the last project that's coming up in Vienna. And what's interesting about this is, uh, this is, uh, for those of you who know the Museum for Angevin de Kunst in Vienna, it's an, they have an encyclopedia, encyclopedic collection really featuring the greats of Vienna arts and design. So the, the basement is full of, uh, you know, uh, Joseph Hoffman pieces and Adolf Loos and, and just the greats. And in my access to, the, to their archives in their basement, I came across something that had sort of defied the typical museum categorization. And it was, defied it because they didn't have an author. And it was this kind of stuck in a dark corner, these sort of forgotten wooden toys that were, they just knew were of the era of um, you know, 1900, 1907. And so I went through these toys and we documented all of them. And then I went through and I created a sort of control group of a certain amount of pieces that would emulate a chess set. And then I sent them into the world. And I sent them into the world with the people I'd worked with directly as fabricators, Lithuania, Mexico, this is Mexico. And I just wanted them to interpret from the pictures what they thought the thing was with the best of their ability. And Lithuania, you know, I kind of couldn't understand. They would take it a little bit in a different direction. Um, you know, some, this was in Ethiopia, someone I met through Johannes, a design school in Addis Ababa, and they actually created a sort of narrative around these pieces, which were really fantastic. And then this arrived from Ethiopia, uh, which I was just amazed, uh, delighted, and thrilled that this person really took the time to interpret in a very sort of pure, uh, artistic way. And then um, this Orseberger. <laughs> This is a German toy maker, and they did it so perfect, it was better than the original. And it was a little spooky, but so they just made this amazing version. And then I had a little more time, so I decided to go into my social network. And I have about, I don't know, almost 4,000 friends, and most of them I don't know. So I thought this piece, maybe I'll know them. And I kind of sent out this open call. I paid everybody the same amount of money. And some people did it, and some people d interpreted it more um, directly, and some were very loose. But I just, I'll show you some of the series of, you know, just this is just a few of them. But in the meantime, I had reached out on Alibaba to uh, a Chinese manufacturer for something unrelated, some, some painted fiberglass, custom color. And she mentioned to me that she was very uh, bored with her job, and she was tired of the electronics, and she was interested in something more creative and maybe housewares related. So I sent her this project. And the thing about working with China, oh, here's someone who's doing a plastic version. They wouldn't, for the same amount of money, she had to make an army of them. So I might pay 15 cents each, but it was still this kind of manufacturing impulse that I started to learn about an, another part of the world. And so just to take you through the, um, the army of my chess pieces, and that is it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we saw, we saw a lot about, uh, in, uh, in relation to your work, a lot about outsourcing and uh, collaboration practice, which is interesting because at the last DLD in January, we had Aaron Coblin and Chris Milk working with data sets on creative collab collaboration. What I wanted to ask you is, and you mentioned it a little bit before, um, how do you manage your expectations in the process when you outsource, let go of control, and have others become co-authors or in well, the artistic process? I mean, in a way, the kind of process that I deploy is a win-win because I can incorporate the idea of surprise into the concept and 
when I say interpretation, I mean really anything goes. It just, you know, maybe it's the size of this room. And I kind of leave it up, I, I leave it up to the fabricator to kind of create the narrative. And in that sense, the tolerance is just totally ambiguous. So it's based on trust and letting go? I, tr I trust. I, I mean, I've, you know, if it shows up broken, I'm, I even am okay with that. The fact, the pieces from China, there were so many, and they were all jammed in two boxes with holes and legs and heads sticking out, and they were shattered. But I'm going to ex exhibit that um, brokenness as part of the narrative. Yeah, the brokenness and uh, imperfect and uh, ephemeral is part of your work as a pattern, I would say, in general. I have a last question because I see time is running and I get signals. Um, but um, as we are here on this uh, fantastic porcelain manufacturer company uh, setup, and I know you like porcelain, maybe this could be a good collaboration with them. Maybe this could be a start for a dialogue with the um, company. Is Mr. Anders here? Um, Anders Thomas, are you there? Maybe you can say a little bit about your arts and design program, and that could be a good match. You could do something together. Um, thank you, Johannes. Thank, thank you, Pei. Um, like for Nymphenburg was always a little bit uh, was always innovation. Innovation is a tradition at Nymphenburg. So we work together with contemporary artists like I don't know Kiki Smith, Jo von Lieshout, um, Wim de Boer, and they come up and bring our craftsmanships to the to the next edge to of perfection and imperfection. And that is how, where we get our new sources of uh, innovation and um, uh, product um, know-how, so research and development from. And thank you. I, I hope this could become a match, but to pay a question to you, how do you, when, like, see different contexts, um, let's say you work in a cultural uh, institution or in a gallery, but then you could work with a company or for a public commission, because I know you're also working for the Los Angeles airport and for the Berlin yet to come Brandenburg airport on larger pieces, how do you treat, uh, take decisions? What's important for you when you start working with companies um, linking arts to, uh, as narratives to innovation? Yeah, because a lot of companies working with technology and new ideas techno uh, and don't necessarily have the storytelling and the narrative like arts or creativity could provide. Mm -hmm. How do you treat that? In your, where do you do take your decision on that? I mean, I think it's similar to doing sort of an installation. You know, every space has a sort of contingencies. And so working with a, something that isn't a cultural sort of institution or a gallery has also some interesting contingencies that you can mine. Like, for instance, you know, Nymphenburg or, or um, Maharam or another company that's approached me is that, um, you know, there, there's something weird about it. Like there's a distribution and a viewership and an ad infinitum distribution that you're not going to get in a cultural situation or in a gallery situation. That to me, this is an opportunity. Mm. I, I mean, I think absolutely. Okay, so we heard a lot about your work. I guess time sensitivity um, lets us close this down unless there's an urgent question from the audience, uh, if there is one. Maybe we can extend, otherwise we would leave it to others to continue.